You may recall that I covered Cinemaware a few weeks back, a trailblazing Amiga developer that tried to make games that were more driven by narrative than gameplay. Even if some said that their games were shallow, they still cut a path different from virtually anyone else at the time and were certainly influential, not just in the future, but back when they were around. Now of course, it's easy to say that a company was influential without actually providing proof of it. But today we have a game that does just that, one highly inspired by Cinemaware's model that at one point may have even ended up being released by them. That game is a dark classic from the days of the Amiga and the ST, a war game with a pretty hefty message indeed. Today we are looking at Lost Patrol from 1990. Lost Patrol takes us back to one of the most controversial conflicts of the modern age, Vietnam. The Vietnam War is still a pretty touchy subject even today, and even now you won't find all that many games which cover it. The ones that do usually have a much darker edge than your average gun ho shooter, which is certainly appropriate. And Lost Patrol certainly doesn't shy away from the darkness. This isn't a shooter, a real-time strategy game or anything like that. It's a game of survival. The original concept from Ian Harlin was a game set in the conflict in the Cinemaware mode, but with more gameplay. There would be mini-games, but they would be much more involved and varied. Harlin shopped the concept around to various companies, including Cinemaware themselves, who unfortunately turned it down. Ultimately though, the game was accepted by Ocean Software, with Gary Bracey, Ocean's brilliant software manager, giving it the nod. So why Ocean? Several reasons perhaps. The most direct one was that they'd already published a licensed game based on Platoon. Now you may well wonder how such a brutal and agonising film got a computer game tie-in, it's hardly one filled with action heroes after all, and yet the game was both a critical and commercial success for the company. Another way of looking at it is by examining some of their older games which did have something of a penchant for both narrative drive and survival, the likes of The Great Escape and the fascinating Where Time Stood Still. Lost Patrol, like those games, does fit right into the evolution of the survival game genre. Still, for Ocean, the idea of making a Platoon 2, essentially, was the main motivation, and it was one that somewhat clashed with the intentions of Ian Harlin and Simon Cook, the designer, artist and coder of the game respectively. As Harlin fleshed the project out, the Vietnam War became an obsession. If he wasn't in the library reading books on the conflict or drawing the art for the game, he was watching Vietnam War movies. On the other hand, as related by Harlin himself, this is around the time that Ocean, transitioning to the 16-bit platforms, had utterly figured out their formula for successful licensed games. They wanted Lost Patrol to be a more action-based title that could fit alongside not just the original Platoon, but the likes of Batman and Navy Seals. There was something of a clash there, to be sure. And yet, despite that clash, the designers ultimately had their way. Lost Patrol evolved from a Cinemaware-esque title into one with a highly serious narrative, complete with difficult moral choices and a lot of references to various aspects of the conflict, an attempt to accurately and emotionally convey the feel of trekking and fighting in that jungle. Ocean were right to let the duo do what they wanted. Lost Patrol was ultimately a very successful game, not to mention a critical smash that to this day is still remembered as one of the most unique war games you can find which now leaves us to simply examine just what it's all about and see if it's still worth playing. The year is 1966 and a helicopter filled with US troops is returning from some rest and relaxation in Saigon. But these troops are about to be brought back in with a bang. The helicopter crashes in the central highlands, right in the heart of Viet Cong territory. Seven soldiers survive the crash, albeit with some injuries, randomly set at the beginning of each game, and with limited ammo and food, they will have to complete a 58 mile trek to Du Hoc, the nearest US military outpost. You play as Sergeant Charlie Weaver, who has taken the command of the Lost Patrol, and it's up to you to bring them all to safety. Most of your decisions are made here, in the main map screen. The squad are represented by a little cross near the downed helicopter on the left. At any time you can check your men and get a rough recon of the immediate area in front. 
You control movement via the compass. Click the centre of it and you can choose whether to progress normally, with extreme caution, or march double time. Other options include setting traps with grenades and claymores, controlling the distribution of rations, searching the area, and, very important, resting and digging in. It is imperative that you keep the soldiers as well rested as possible. If you push them too hard, then they will lose morale. If they lose too much morale, then they could question your leadership, they could desert you, or worse still, they could even kill you if you're that bad a leader. Each movement takes roughly 20 minutes or so, and it's often best to be consistent at least. 20 minutes rest for every 40 minutes of movement, perhaps. You may be in constant danger, but don't overwork your squad. Your life depends on it. Speaking of life, you'll inevitably be fighting for it against the Viet Cong. You'll run into them soon enough, and this is where you get the mini-games. There's several of them, and most of them are good. There's a game where you man a machine gun against a VC patrol, one where you take part in a sniper battle, hand-to-hand -hand combat with a lone troop, fishing out a machine gun nest with grenades, and trying to get past a minefield, crawling and stabbing the ground every step of the way. These minigames are never not tough, especially the VC patrol game, because ammo is very limited. If you run out of bullets, you're going to have to retreat, and during that retreat, it's likely that one of the crew is going to get shot. One false move can be disastrous. Letting a grenade into your nest, for example, is a guaranteed way for your entire squad to be maimed or killed. A soldier killed in action will be remembered, and the game will carry on without him, but if Sergeant Weaver dies at any point, then the game is over. Needless to say, death can come to you in many different ways. There is a certain cruelty and unfair nature to Lost Patrol. Things could be going so well, you could be making progress with a squad that's still relatively healthy, and then all of a sudden, Weaver steps on a booby trap and gets blown to bits. Game over. Bad luck? Well, there are ways to at least try to make your own luck. In the main, making the most out of your squad. The platoon isn't just a bunch of random goons who essentially act as extra lives, they all have certain skills that come in handy. Gomez, for example, is a fantastic point man. Put him as lead or scout and you'll have a much better chance of actually finding the booby traps before they kill you. Buckman is an expert marksman and Blom is a trained martial artist, making them invaluable for the sniper and hand-to-hand -hand sections respectively. There is a certain area where the game gets very platoon indeed though, when you encounter other people, or indeed, villagers. These are marked on your map, and when you get there, a whole bunch of things can happen. I mean, if you want to roleplay as Sergeant Barnes, then you can make that choice. Scorch the earth, wipe out an entire village. Yes, it's a moral choice that is basically, will you do this extremely horrible thing or will you not? But you didn't get a lot of this in 1989. Actually exploring or interrogating can bring about different scenarios, mind. Hey, maybe you might be invited to stay the night, and the lady of the village will cook you a comforting bowl of pho, restoring your health and morale. There is, however, a chance that the bowl of pho is poisoned, killing your entire squad. Or you push the villagers too far with your interrogation, suddenly a young man shoots one of your squad dead, and before you know it, the rest of the platoon retaliates, and in minutes, the entire population of the village is dead. There are possible benefits to the villagers, such as finding ammo and rations, but there's a risk. You may choose to ignore them entirely and try to find supplies as you go. Don't forget to search the area after you've completed any of the mini-games against the VC. There's a lot to say about the presentation too, even if most of the game is spent looking at a map. In Cinemaware style, your progress is interspersed with a lot of evocative drawings and animations, all created by Ian Harlin in good old Deluxe Paint 2. There's also the odd little bit of digitised footage of the war itself, created using a programme called Vidiamiga. But if there's one thing that's going to keep you going through the game, it's the music. This sombre creation, all driving bassline and ominous pad synth, is one of the all-time great Amiga songs, one of the best songs you'll find in any war game, right up there with Narcissus from Cannon Fodder. Depressive as it is, it's weirdly catchy too. It probably won't leave your head for a long time after. The song was created by Chris Glaister, who at the time was all of 16 years old and ultimately decided against a career in video game music. A one-hit wonder, perhaps, but oof, what a hit. With a game like this, though, I can only talk about these core elements so much. 
The best way perhaps to describe Lost Patrol is through telling the story of how close I came to do Hock and how it all played out. I wanted to get there quickly so I immediately set the squad to double march, trek for 30 minutes, then rest for 10 and so on. Somewhere near the first village, Blom defeats a soldier in a fist fight, but he takes quite a bit of damage and is never really the same afterwards. We carry on however. In the first village we question the natives and they tell us they have no supplies, but Gomez is small enough to fit into a tunnel that's full of them. A more forceful interrogation reveals food and ammo and we leave without harming anyone. At this point we should be good for food and ammunition for the rest of the journey. The journey continues, but Blom gets Everika, and soon more takes heavy damage in another fist fight. Every mile saps more strength out of them. Still, we defeat the VC in all encounters. Casa's sniping and Gomez's grenades deal with nests, and we suffer minimal damage at the hands of their patrols. But in a sense, the damage has already been done. Two of our squad members are seriously hurt. Other encounters with natives produce little except VC ambushes and an interrogation against frightened rice field workers that results in little but a handful of grains. As we get into the fourth day, the troops get ever more restless. They start to complain. Kane is the first to do so. Weary and having taken a bullet, he openly complains about Weaver's leadership having a serious effect on morale. This does not last long. Weaver takes the decision to make him a scout, and soon after he succumbs to a Viet Cong soldier in a fight. Weaver almost feels relieved, but this will not last for long. Kane's complaining and subsequent death sends morale on an irreversible downslide. As we trek through the jungle it too becomes clear that more is not going to make it. He is feverish, his wounds are nagging, he is on his last legs. A dying curse slips from his lips as he too curses Weaver's long death march before finally he breathes his last. The platoon is now down to five. Weaver, at this point only, decides to decrease the pace, but after over 35 miles of relentless double time marching, the decision has come way too late. Case is the only soldier even vaguely loyal to him. For the rest, talk of mutiny is open, with Buckman simply taking Kane's place as Weaver's head detractor. Blom is the next to go. Even he, with his combat experience but in a highly weakened state, could not withstand another fight with a rabid VC soldier. The only hope that Weaver has may lie in a nearby village that could possibly be friendly, that could allow for a decent night's rest and may well give the remaining soldiers the energy for one last push towards Du Hock. But it is not to be. Gomez has had enough. Suddenly he decides to sit on the trail, refusing to move, and the only thing that can be done is to leave him behind. Madness begins to set in as the squad leader loses control. Within sight of the village, the remaining soldiers openly rebel against Weaver's leadership, refusing to do so much as follow his directions and take in their own path. In doing so, the squad is led into a minefield surrounding the village. So much for a friendly welcome. As if that's not enough, a Viet Cong patrol ambushes the Soy Horde. Weaver takes a last stand, mounting the gun and giving it all that he's got, soldier after soldier falling in front of him. It is a Herculean effort, and ultimately the Con retreat. Weaver returns to his group, only to find that none are left. Both Buckman and Case are dead. Was it the minefield? Was it the ambush? Who even knows at this point? Weaver attempts to go it alone, knowing how close he is to the outpost, but the jungle proves too much. No one is left to carry the weight along with him. He becomes delirious, he falls into a sleep, a sleep from which he never awakened. And so ends the story of the Lost Patrol. So there it is, as close as I came. What could I have done differently? Well, perhaps it was a mistake to overwork the group and go straight into double march. I'd hoped to counterbalance that with frequent resting, but it wasn't enough. When Blom and Moore got seriously injured, our pace slowed considerably, so we had all the drawbacks of double marching, but none of the benefits. The victories in those fistfights proved to be Pyrrhic, and as they both degraded, well, so did the morale of the group. And at the end, perhaps it was a mistake to divert and try for that village. It may have been best to just go for broke and cut a straight path towards Duhok as quick as we possibly could. Maybe we wouldn't have hit the minefield that ultimately proved to be our undoing. Would we have made it? Well, woulda, shoulda, coulda. Maybe, maybe not. Perhaps likely not. 
In Lost Patrol you can have a perfectly good plan in place, and you can make it far, but the tiniest fin can cause it to ever so slowly unravel. Such is the nature of the beast. In summary, playing Lost Patrol is quite the humbling experience. This isn't a game you can expect to breeze through. In all of a second, this game can end. And when you die, a helmet perched on the top of a rifle will be all that remains. Because, you know, war is hell. The people behind this game spent Lord knows how long learning about both the war itself and the cinematic interpretations of it, and it really did come out strongly in the final product. There's a powerful message, a reminder to take care and support those who served and went through not just this conflict, but all conflicts, one that's still very relevant today. Lost Patrol takes a subject and an event that can be hard for games to approach and creates a powerful piece of software. It rightly deserves a place amongst the classics of the Amiga and ST. Bluntly put, they just don't make them like this anymore. Bye for now. Many thanks for watching. If you like the video then do please like, subscribe and all of that. Also special thanks to these members of the community who contribute through Patreon. Adam Schaefer, Alex Stoko, Alexander Jazeri, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Daniel Briggs, Daniel David Taylor, David Rose, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, George Newton, Graffin Blackpool, Ian Roberts, James Id, James Loveridge, Jason Durso, Jason Goy, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Josh Jensen, Lee Norris, Mark Greaves, Martin Pataki, Mike's Games Room, Morton Scunnin, Nanette McCrone, Nicholas Tristan, Olaf Albin, Peter Jack, Peter Sidon, Phil Taprog, Piotr Margell, Pocky Southmaid, Rachel Maxwell, Romeo, Ryan Burford, Sammy Lee, Samuel Victor, Scott Coulter, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stephen Warner, Yucca Operator, and Zach Roach.